from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of DockerCon Live 2020. Brought to you by Docker and its ecosystem partners. Welcome, welcome, welcome to DockerCon 2020. We've got over 50,000 people registered, so there's clearly a ton of interest in the world of Docker Netties, as I like to call it. And we've assembled a power panel of open source and cloud native experts to talk about where things stand in 2020 and where we're headed. I'm Sean Conley. I'll be the moderator for today's panel. I'm also a proud alum of JBoss, Red Hat, SpringSource, VMware, and Hortonworks. And I'm broadcasting from my hometown of Philly. Our panelists include Michelle Nurali, Senior Software Engineer at Microsoft, joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we have Kelsey Hightower, Principal Developer Advocate at Google Cloud, joining us from Washington State. And we have Chris Anizik, uh, CTO, COO at the CNCF, joining us from Austin, Texas. So I think we have the country pretty well covered. Um, thank you all for uh, spending time with us on this CUBE Power Panel. Um, Chris, I'm going to start with you. Let's dive right in. Um, you've been in the middle of the Docker Netties wave since the beginning with a clear focus on building a better world through open collaboration. Um, what are your thoughts on how the open source landscape has evolved over the past few years? Where are we in 2020 and where are we headed from both a community and a tech perspective? Just curious to get things sized up. Sure, uh, you know, when CNCF started about uh, roughly four, over four years ago, uh, the technology mostly focused on just the things around Kubernetes, uh, you know, monitoring Kubernetes with technology like Prometheus. And I think in 2020, in the future, we've definitely, uh, quote unquote, moved up the stack. So there's a lot of tools being built on the periphery now. So there's a lot of tools that handle running different types of workloads on Kubernetes. So things like uh, Kubevert, essentially runs VMs on Kubernetes, which is crazy, not just containers. Um, you have folks at um, you know, Microsoft experimenting with a project called uh, Crosslet, which is trying to run WebAssembly workloads natively <coughs> on, on Kubernetes. So I think what we've uh, seen now is, is more and more tools built around the periphery while the core of Kubernetes has stabilized. So different technologies and spaces such as security and different ways to run different types of workloads in Kubernetes. That's kind of what I've seen. So do you have a fair amount of sort of vendors as well as end users still submitting in projects in, you know, is there still a yeah, pretty high volume? Yeah, we have uh, 48 total projects in CNCF right now. And mm -hmm. uh, Michelle could speak a little bit more to this being on the TOC, but the, the pipeline for new projects uh, is, is quite extensive and it covers all sorts of spaces from Types of service meshes to security projects and, and so on. So it's ever kind of ever so expanding and filling in gaps in that in that cloud native landscape that we have. Awesome, um, so Michelle. Let's let's head to you. Um, but before we actually dive in, let's talk a little glory days. Uh, rumor has it that you were the fifth grade kickball championship team captain. <laughs> so, are the rumors true? Um, <laughs> they are. They are. I a speech at the end of the year it was the first talk I ever gave. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it was really fun. I was captain because I wasn't really great at anything else. <laughs> but <laughs> I could definitely cheer on the team. But uh, yeah. A little bit better than my eighth grade spelling champ, uh, you know, award. So uh, <laughs> I think I'd rather have the kickball. But um, you're, you've definitely, uh, you know, spent a lot of time uh, leading in open source. You've been across many projects for many years. Um, so how does the art and science of collaboration, inclusivity, and teamwork vary? Because you're involved in a, a variety of efforts, both in the CNCF and even outside of that. And then what are some tips for expanding the tent of uh, open source projects? That's such a good um, question. You know, I think it's about transparency. Just come in, and tell people what you really need to do and clearly artic articulate your problem is the more clearly you articulate your problem and why you can't solve it with any other solution, the more people are going to understand what you're trying to do and be able to collaborate with you better. So I think what I love about open source is that where I've seen it succeed is where incentives of different perspectives and parties align. 
and you're just transparent about what you want. So you can collaborate where it makes sense, even if you compete um, as a company with another company on, in the same area. So I really, I really like that. But I just feel like transparency and honesty is what it comes comes down to, and clearly communicating those uh, in, those um, objectives. Yeah, in the uh, various foundations, I think one of the things that I've seen, particularly Apache Software Foundation and others, is the notion of checking your badge at the door, um, because it, it can get. The competition might be between companies, but in many respects, you have engineers across many companies that are just kicking butt with the tech they contribute. Um, and it, it, you know, it, you know, claiming victory in one one way or the other might might make for interesting marketing uh, drama. But uh, you know, I think that's that's a little bit of the challenge. Um, you know, uh, in in the some of the um, in you know standards based work you're doing, I know CNI and some other things. Are they similar or are they different? Um, how would you compare and contrast them to something that's a little more structured like the CNCF? Yeah, so uh, most of what I do is in the CNCF, but um, there's like specs and there's projects. Uh, I think what CNCF does a great job is, um, at is uh, just iterating to make it an easier place for developers to collaborate. You can ask the CNCF for basically whatever you need, and they'll try to, their best to figure out how to make it happen. And we just continue to work on making the processes are clearer and uh, more transparent. Um, and I think, uh, like in terms of like specs and and projects, those are such different um, collaboration environments, right? Because if you're in a project, you kind of have to say, okay, I want this feature, or I want this bug fixed. Uh, but when you're in a spec environment, you have to think kind of a little outside of the box and like what framework do you want to work in? Um, you have to think a little farther ahead in terms of is this solution or this decision we're going to make going to last for the next how many ever years? Um, you have to get more of a buy-in from all of the um, all of the key stakeholders and maintainers. So it's a little bit of a, a longer process, I think. But what's so beautiful is that you have this really solid um, standard or interface uh, that opens up an ecosystem and uh, allows people to build things that you could never have even imagined or dreamed of. So I think that's pretty cool. Gotcha. So um, Kelsey, we'll head over to you. Is yeah, you know, I mean, your focus is on you know, developer advocate, you've been on the cloud native front lines for many years. Um, develop, today, developers are faced with a, a, you know, a ton of moving parts, spanning containers, functions, cloud service primitives, including container services, serverless platforms, you know, lots more, right? I mean, there's just a ton of choice. How do you help developers maintain a minimalist mantra in the face of such a wealth of choice you know, I think minimalism, I hear you talk about that periodically. I know you're a fan of that. Um, how do you pass that on in your dev developer advocacy uh, in your day-to-day -day work? Yeah, I think uh, for most developers, most of this is not really the top of mind for them. It's something you may see a post on Hacker News and you might double click into it. Uh, maybe someone on your team brought one of these tools in and maybe it leaks up into your workflow, so you're kind of forced to think about it. But for most developers, they just really want to continue writing code like they've been doing. And the best of these projects, they'll never see, right? They just work, they get out of the way, they help them with logging, they help them run their application. But for most people, this isn't the core idea of the job for them. For people in operations, on the other hand, uh, maybe these components fill a gap. Uh, so they look at a lot of this stuff that you see in the CNCF and the open source space as number one, various companies or teams sharing the way that they do things, right? So these are ideas that are put into the open source. Some of them will turn into products. Some of them will just stay as projects that have mutual benefit for multiple people. Uh, but for the most part, it's like walking through an aisle in like Home Depot, right? You pick the tools that you need. You can safely ignore the ones you don't need. And maybe something looks interesting and maybe you study it to see if, that, if you have a problem. And for most people, if you don't have that problem that that tool solves, you should be happy. <laughs> no one needs every project. And I think that's where the um, foundation for confusion. So my main job is 
to help people not get stuck in confusion land and just be pragmatic and just use the tools that work for them. Yeah, and you, you've spent um, the last little while in the serverless uh, space, really sort of diving into that area. Um, compare and contrast, I guess, you know, what you found there, you know, minimalist approach, you know, who, you know, who are you speaking to from a serverless perspective versus that are the broader CNCF? Um, so the serverless thing, the thing that really pushed me over, I was teaching my uh, daughter how to make a website, right? So she's on her Chromebook making a website. And she's hitting 127.0.0.1. And it looks like GeoCities from the 90s, but look, she's making website. And uh, she wanted her friends to take a look. So she copied and pasted from her browser 127.0.0.1. And none of her friends could pull it up. So this is the point where every parent has to cross that line and say, hey, do I really need to sit down and teach my daughter about Linux and Docker and Kubernetes? That isn't her main goal. Her goal was to just launch her website in a way that someone else can see it. So we got Firebase installed on her laptop. She ran one command, Firebase deploy. And her site was up in a few minutes and she sent it over to her friend. And there you go, she was off in the running. The whole serverless movement has that philosophy as one of those stated goals. That needs to be the workflow. So, you know, I think serverless is starting to get closer and closer. You start to see us talk about, and Chris mentioned this earlier, for moving up the stack. Where we're going to up the stack, the North Star there is that kind of feel where you get to focus on what you're doing and not necessarily how to do it underneath. And I think serverless is not quite there yet for every type of workload, stateless web apps, check, uh, event-driven workflows, check, but not necessarily for things like machine learning and uh, some other workloads that more traditional enterprises want to run. So there's still work to do there. So serverless for me serves as the North Star for why all these projects exist for people that may have to roll their own platform to provide that experience. So um, Chris, on a related note um, with what you know, we were just talking about with Kelsey, what, what's your ex uh, perspective on the explosion of the cloud native landscape, right? There's, there's a ton of individual projects. Um, each can be used separately, right? But in many cases, they're sort of like Lego blocks and, and, and used, you know, um, together, right? So things like the service mesh interface, standardizing interfaces, um, th so things can snap together more easily, I think, are some of the approaches. But are you doing anything specifically to encourage this sort of cross-fertilization and collaboration of pluggability? Or, I mean, because there's just a ton of projects, not only at the CNCF, but outside the CNCF that need to plug in. Yeah, I, I mean, <clears throat> a lot of this happens organically. You know, CNCF really provides kind of the neutral home where companies, competitors uh, could trust each other to kind of build interesting technology. Um, you know, we don't force, uh, you know, integration or collaboration. It kind of happens uh, on its own. We essentially allow the market uh, to decide what a successful project is, um, you know, long term or what an integration is. We have a a great technical oversight committee that kind of helps shepherd the overall technical vision for the organization and sometimes steps in and tries to do the right thing when it comes to potentially integrating a project. You know, previously we had this issue where um, there was a project called Open Tracing and an effort called Open Census, which is basically trying to standardize how, you know, you're going to deal with uh, metrics, telemetry, and so on in a cloud native world that were kind of essentially competing with each other. Uh, the CNCF, TOC, and community, I came together and merged those uh, projects into one uh, parent effort called Open Telemetry. And so that to me is like mm -hmm. a kind of a good case study of how our community kind of helps bridge things, but we don't, we don't force things. We essentially want our community of end users and vendors to kind of decide which technology is, is best um, in, in the long term and, and we'll kind of support that. Okay, awesome. Um, and Michelle, you're, You've been focused on make, making distributed systems digestible, which to me is about simplifying things, right? And so back when Docker arrived on the scene, you know, some people referred to it as uh, developer dopamine, which I love that term, um, because it simplified a bunch of crufty stuff for developers and actually helped them focus on doing their job, writing code, delivering code. Um, what's happening in the community to help developers wire together multi-part modern apps in a way that's elegant, digestible, feels like a dopamine rush. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, that was the, that was one of the goals of the home project was to make it easier to deploy an application on Kubernetes so that you could see what the finished product looks like and then dig into all of the things that, uh, that application is composed of all of the resources. So I'm really passionate about, um, this kind of stuff for a, a while now. And I love seeing projects that come into the space, um, that have this same goal and just iterate and make things easier. Um, I think we have a ways to go still. I think a lot of the iOS developers and Node.js developers I get to talk to don't really care that much about Kubernetes. Um, they just want to, like Kelsey said, just you know, focus on their uh, focus on their code. So um, one of the projects that I really like uh, uh, just working with is Tilt. It gives you this like um, dashboard in your CLI. It aggregates all your logs from your applications, and it kind of watches your um, watches your application changes and uh, reconfigures those changes in Kubernetes so you can see what's going on. It'll catch errors. Um, anything with a dashboard, I like love these days. So Kiali is like a metrics dashboard that's integrated with um, Istio and gives you a service graph of your um, service mesh and uh, lets you see the metrics running there. I love, I love that, I love that uh, dashboard. Um, so much. Um, Linkerd has some really good uh, service graph images too. So anything that helps me as an end user, uh, which not technically an end user, but um, but me as a person who's just trying to get stuff up and running and working, um, see the state of uh, the world easily and digest that has been really exciting to see. And I'm seeing more and more dashboards uh, come to light, and I'm very excited about that. Yeah, as you know, as part of the DockerCon, just as a person who'll be attending some of the sessions, I'm really looking forward to see where uh, Docker Compose is going. I know they open up the spec to broader input. Um, I think yeah. your point, the good one, is there's a little, there's a bit more work to kind of, you know, really embrace um, sort of the wealth of application artifacts that are that compose a larger application. So there's there's definitely work the broader community needs to lean in on. I think. I'm glad you brought that up, actually. Compose is something that I should have mentioned, um, and I'm glad you bring that up. I, I want to see you know, programming language libraries integrate with the Compose spec. I really want to see what happens with that. I think it's great that they opened that up and made that a spec, because obviously people really like using Compose. Excellent. Um, so Kelsey, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on your January post uh, on ChangeLog entitled Monoliths are the future. <laughs> your post actually re really resonated with me. My son works at a, uh, for a software company in Austin, Texas. So your hometown there, Chris. Yeah. Um, shout out to Will and the uh, Koros team. Um, his development work focuses on adding modern features via microservices uh, as extensions to the core monolith that the company was founded on. Um, so just share some thoughts on monoliths, microservices, and also, you know, what's what's delivering dopamine from your perspective, um, sort of more broadly. But uh, monoliths, uh, people usually phrase as monoliths versus microservices, but I get the sense you don't believe it's an either or. Yeah, I think most companies from the pragmatic, so this that argument is one of pragmatism. Most companies, have trouble designing any app, monolith, deployable, or microservices architecture. And then these things evolve over time. Unless you're really careful, it's really hard to know how to slice these things, right? So taking an idea or a problem and just knowing how to perfectly compartmentalize it into individual deployable components, that's hard for even the best people to do and double down knowing the actual solution to the particular problem. A lot of problems people are solving, they're solving for the first time. It's really interesting. Like our industry in general, a lot of people who work in it have never solved the particular problem that they're trying to solve for the first time. So that's interesting. The other part there is that most of these tools that are here to help are really only at the infrastructure layer, right? We're talking freeways and bridges and toll bridges, but there's nothing that happens in the actual 
developer space right there in memory. So the libraries that interface to the structured logging, the libraries that deal with rate limiting, the libraries that deal with authorization, can this person make this query with this user ID? A lot of those things are still left for developers to figure out on their own. So while we have things like Kubernetes and FluidD, we have all of these tools to deploy apps into those targets. Most developers still have the problem of everything you do above that line. And to be honest, the majority of the complexity has to be resolved right there in the app. That's the thing that's taking requests directly from the user. And this is where maybe as an industry, we're overcorrecting. So we had, you know, you say you come from the JBoss world. Uh, I kind of started a lot of my system administration. There's where we kind of focused a little bit more on the actual application needs. Um, maybe from around it as well. But now what we're seeing is things like Spring Boot start to offer a little bit more integration points in the application space itself. Uh, so I think the biggest parts that are missing now are what are the frameworks people will use for authorization? So we have projects like OPA, OPA, Open Policy Agent, for those that are new to that. It gives you this very low level framework, but you still have to understand the concepts around what does it mean to allow someone to do something? And one misconfiguration all your security goes out of the window. Uh, so I think for most developers, th this, is, this is where the next set of challenges lie, if not actually the original challenge. So for some people, they were able to solve most of these problems with virtualization, right? Run some scripts, virtualize everything and be fine. And monoliths were okay for that. For some reason, we've thrown pragmatism out of the window and some people are saying the only way to solve these problems is by breaking the app into a thousand pieces Forget the fact that you had trouble managing one piece. You're going to somehow find the ability to manage 1,000 pieces with these tools underneath, but still not solving the actual developer problem. So this is where you've seen it already with a couple of popular blog posts from other companies. They cut too deep. They're going from 2,000, 3,000 microservices back to maybe 100 or 200. So to my world, it's going to be not just one monolith, but end up maybe having 10 or 20 monoliths that may be um, reflect the organization that you have versus the architectural pattern that you're at. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I view it as like a constellation of stars and planets, etc. Um, you know, where you might you might have a star that has a variety of you know, which is a monolith, and you have a variety of sort of planetary uh, microservices that sort of float around it. Um, but that that's that's reality. That's the reality of um, modern applications, particularly if you're not starting from a clean slate. Um, and your point's a good one is, in many respects, I think the infrastructure as code movement has um, helped automate a bit of the deployment of the core platform. Um, I've been personally focused on app development, JBoss, as well as Sp Spring Source, uh, the Spring team. I know those, I know that tech pretty well over the years because I was involved with that. Um, you know, uh, so, I find that James Governor's discussion of progressive delivery really resonates with me as a developer, not so much as an infrastructure deployer, right? So continuous delivery is more of an infrastructure notion. Progressive delivery, um, you know, uh, feature flags, those types of things are app level concepts, minimizing the blast radius of your, your the, feet, the new features you're deploying. Um, that type of stuff, I think, begins to speak to the pain of application delivery. So I guess I'll put this up. Uh, Michelle, I might aim it to you, and then we'll sort of go around the horn. What are your thoughts on sort of the progressive delivery area? How, how could that potentially begin to impact cloud native over 2020? Like, I'm looking for some rallying cries that um, move up the stack and give some a set of best practices, if you will. And I think uh, James Governor and Red Mock are poking on something I think is pretty important. Yeah, I think it's all about, you know, automating all that stuff that you don't really need to know about. Um, like Flagger is an awesome uh, progressive delivery tool. Uh, you can just deploy something and, and people have been asking for so many years, um, ever since I've been in this space, it's like, how do I do AB deployment? How do I do Canary? How do I do, how do I execute these different deployment strategies? And Flagger is a really good example. For uh, for example, it's a it's a really good way um, to execute these deployment strategies. But then you know make sure that everything's happening correctly via observing metrics. Roll back if you need to, uh, so you don't destroy your whole system. I think it 
solves a problem. It allows you to take risks, but also uh, kind of keeps you safe in that, um, you know, it's you can be confident as you roll out your changes that it all works. It's metrics driven. Um, so I'm just really looking forward to seeing more tools like that and, and dashboards that enable that kind of functionality. Chris, what, what are your thoughts in that, that progressive delivery area? I mean, CNCF uh, alone has a lot of projects, you know, in this space, things like Argo that are tackling it. But I, I kind of want to go back a little bit to your point around developer dopamine. You know, as, mm. as someone that probably spent about uh, a decade of his career focused on, you know, developer tooling and, you know, back if you remember the Eclipse IDE and that whole integrated experience, I was blown away recently by a demo from uh, GitHub. They have something called Code Spaces, which you know, a long time ago, I was trying to build development environments that essentially, if you were uh, an engineer that, you know, joined a team recently, you could basically get an environment quickly started with all everything configured, source code checked out, environment properly set up. And, you know, that was a very hard problem. This is like before container days and so on. And to see something, you know, like code spaces where you go to a repo or project, you know, open it up, you know, behind the scenes, they have a container that is set up for the environment that you need to build and just have a VS Code ID integrated experience, to me is completely magical. It hits like developer dopamine immediately for me because a lot of the problems when you're going to work with a project to contribute, that whole initial bootstrap of, you know, oh, you need to, you know, make sure you have this library, this is all, it's so incredibly uh, painful on top of just setting up your developer environment. So as we continue to move the, up the stack, I think you're going to see an incredible amount of improvements around the developer tooling and developer experience that uh, people have powered by a lot of this cloud native technology behind the scenes that people may uh, not uh, know about. Yeah, because I know I've been talking with the uh, the team over at Docker, you know, the work they're doing with that uh, desktop, being able to aim local environment, make sure it matches as closely as possible as, as your deployed environments that you might be targeting. Um, these are some of the pains, you know, um, that I see. It's hard for developers to get um, bootstrapped up. It might take them a day or two to actually just set up their uh, local laptop and development environment, and particularly if they change teams. So it's that that complexity really corralling that down and not necessarily being overly prescriptive as to what tool you use, right? So if you're visual code, great. It should, it should feel integrated into that environment if you use a different environment or if you feel more comfortable at the uh, command line, you should be able to opt into that. Um, that's that's some of the stuff I I, I get excited uh, to potentially see over 2020 as we as things progress up the stack, as you said. Um, so uh, Mich Michelle, um, just from an innovation train perspective, I think we covered a little bit, you know, what you know, what's the best way for people to get started? I think Kelsey covered a little bit of that, right? Be, being very pragmatic, but um, you know, there's just all this innovation is pretty intimidating. You can get mowed over by the uh, train, so to speak, right? So, um, you know, what what's your advice for how people get started? How do they get involved, um, et cetera? Yeah, it really depends on uh, what you're looking for and uh, what you want to learn. Um, so. If you're someone who's new to the space, uh, honestly, check out the case studies on cncf.io. Those are incredible. You might find um, environments that are similar to your, your organization's environments and I'll read about what worked for them, how they set things up, um, you know, any hiccups they crossed. It'll give you kind of a broad overview of the challenges that people are trying to solve with the technology in this space. And um, you can use that kind of to kind of drill into the areas that you want to learn more about, um, just depending on where you're coming from. Um, I find myself watching old KubeCon talks on the Cloud Native Computing Foundation's um, YouTube channel. Uh, so they have like playlists for um, all of the conferences and the special interest groups um, in CNCF. And uh, I really enjoy talking, or I really enjoy watching, excuse me, uh, the older talks, um, just because uh, 
they kind of explain why things were done uh, the way they were done. And, and that helps me uh, build the tools I built. And um, if you're looking to get involved, if you're building projects or tools or specs and want to contribute, um, we have special interest groups in the CNCF. Um, so you can find that in the CNCF um, Technical Oversight Committee TOC uh, GitHub repo. And uh, so for that, if you want to get involved there, kind of choose a vertical. Do you want to learn about observability? Do you want to drill into networking? Do you care about how to deliver your app? So we have a SIG called App Delivery. Uh, there's a SIG for each um, major vertical. And you can go there to see what is happening in on the edge, really. These are conversations about, OK, what's working, what's not working, and what are the next changes we want to see in the next months? So if you want that kind of granularity and um, uh, discussion on on what's happening like that, then um, definitely join those uh, those meetings and check out those meeting notes and recordings. Yeah. Gotcha. So, um, Kelsey, uh, what what you know as you look at twenty twenty and beyond? I know you've been you know uh, really involved in some of the earlier emerging uh, tech spaces. What what gets you excited when you look forward? Um, you know, what's, uh, what gets your own level of dopamine up versus sort of the broader community? What, you know, um, what do you see coming that we should uh, start thinking about now? Uh, I don't think any of the raw technology pieces get me super excited anymore. Like I, I've seen the circle come around three or four times, right? Like in five years, there's going to be a new thing. There might be a new foundation. There'll be a new set of conferences and we'll all rally up and probably do this again. So what's interesting now is what people are actually using the technology for, right? Some people are launching new things that maybe weren't possible because infrastructure costs were too high. Uh, there are people able to jump into new business segments. Uh, you start to see this with like these channels on YouTube where everyone can buy a mic and a preamp and have their own podcast, right? And be broadcast to the globe uh, just for a few bucks, if not for free. Those kind of revolutionary things are kind of the big deal and they're hard to come by. So I think we've done a good job democratizing these ideas, distributed systems. Um, you know, one company got really good at packaging applications to share with each other. I think that's great. And now we're going to reset again. And now what's going to be interesting is what will people build with this stuff? If we end up building the same things we were building before, and then we're talking about another digital transformation 10 years from now, because people will be, you know, it's going to be funny. But Kubernetes will be the new legacy. It's going to be the things that, oh, man, I got stuck in this Kubernetes thing. And there'll be some governor on TV looking for old school Kubernetes engineers to migrate them to some new thing. Right. That's going to happen. Right. You got to know that. So at some point, this merry-go-round will stop. And we're going to be focused on what you do with it. So the Internet is kind of there. Most people have no idea of the complexity of underwater sea cables. It's beyond one or two people or even one or two companies to comprehend. You're at the point now where most people that jump on the internet are talking about what you do with the internet. You can have Netflix, you can do meetings like this one. Uh, it's about what you do with it. So that's going to be interesting. And we're just not there yet with tech. Tech is so, or infrastructure stuff. We're so in the weeds that most people, you know, almost burn out with just getting to the point where you can start to look at what you do with this stuff. So that's what I'm keeping my eye on is when do we get to the point when people just ship things and build things, right? And I think the closest I've seen so far is in the mobile space. If you're an iOS developer or Android developer, you use the SDK that they give you. Every year, there's some new device that enables some new thing, speech to text, VR, AR, and you import an SDK and it just works. And you can put it in one place and 100 million people can download it at the same time with no DevOps team. That's amazing. When can we do that for server-side applications? That's going to be something I'm going to find really innovative. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, it's um, I could definitely relate. I was uh, Hortonworks uh, in 2011, right? So Hadoop, in many respects, was sort of the uh, precursor to the Kubernetes um, area in that, you know, it was, as I like to refer to, it was, you know, it was a bunch of animals in the zoo. It wasn't just the uh, yellow elephant, right? And um, when things matured beyond, it was basically talking about what kind of analytics they're driving, what type of machine learning algorithms and applications are they delivering. 
you know, you know that's when things tip over into a real solution space. Um, so I, I definitely see that. I think the other cool thing, even just outside of the container and um, you know, container spaces, there's just such a wealth of data uh, related services. Um, and I think how those two worlds come together, you brought up the fact that um, in many respects, serverless is great at stateless, but there's a, just a ton of stateful patterns out there that I think also need to be addressed as these um, richer applications, particularly from a data processing and actionable insights uh, perspective um, get the I want to be so, I also want to be clear on one thing so some people confuse two things here but Michelle yeah. said earlier about for the first time a whole group of people get to learn about distributed systems and things that were reserved to white papers PhDs CS study this stuff is now super accessible and you go to the CNCF site like all the things that you read about or we used to read about you can actually download see how it's implemented and actually change how it works. That is something we, we, we should never say is a waste of time. Learning is always good because someone has to build these types of systems and whether they sell it under the guise of serverless or not, this will always be important. Now that the other side of this is that there are people who are not looking to learn that stuff. Like the majority of the world isn't looking. And in parallel, we should also make this accessible. We should enable people that don't need to learn all of that before they can be productive. So that's like two sides of the argument that can be true at the same time. A lot of people get caught up in everything should just be serverless and everyone learning about distributed systems and contributing and collaborating is wasting time. Right? We can't have a world where there's only one or two companies providing all infrastructure for everyone else and then it's a black box. We don't need no. that, right? So we need to do both of these things in parallel. So I just wanna make sure I'm clear that you know, it's not one of these or the other. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. So um, we'll just hit the final topic, Chris. I think I'll ask you to help close this out. Um, COVID-19 clearly has changed how people work and collaborate. I figured we'd sort of, you know, you know, sort of end on how do you see, so DockerCon is going to a virtual event. Um, uh, you know, inherently the open source community is distributed Right and is uh, used to sort of not face-to-face -face collaboration, but there's a lot of value that comes together by assembling a tent where people can meet. Um, you know, what's the best way? You know, like, how do you see things playing out? What's the best way uh, for for this to um, evolve in the face of the new normal? I think in the short term, you're definitely going to see a lot of virtual events propping up all over the place. You know, in different themes, verticals. I've I've already attended a handful of virtual events the last few weeks from Red Hat Summit, uh, Open Compute Summit to a Cloud Native Summit. Um, you know, you'll, you'll see more and more of these. I think in the long term, you know, you know once, you know, the world, you know, either, uh, you know, gets past, you know, COVID, there's, there's a vaccine or something. I think the innate nature for people to want to get together and, you know, meet face to face and deal with all those serendipitous, um, you know, activities you would see in a conference will come back, but I think virtual events will augment um, these things in the short term. You know, one benefit we've seen, like you mentioned before, you know, DockerCon can have 50,000 people at it. You know, I don't remember what the last Docker Con, physical DockerCon had, but that's definitely an order of magnitude more. So being able to do these virtual events to augment potential, uh, you know, physical events in the future so you can build a more inclusive community so people who not travel um, to your event or weren't lucky enough to win a scholarship could still somehow interact during the course of the event to me is, is awesome. And I hope something that we kind of take away when, you know, we start, you know, all doing these virtual events, when, you know, we get back to kind of physical events, we find a way to kind of ensure that these things are inclusive for everyone uh, and not just folks that can kind of physically uh, make it there. So uh, those are, those are my thoughts on, on the topic. Uh, and wish you the best of luck planning uh, with DockerCon and so on. So I'm kind of excited to see uh, how it turns out. 50,000 is a lot of people, and that just terrifies me from a Cloud Native Con, Kubecon, uh point of view, because we'll probably be somewhere. <laughs> yep, get ready. <laughs> too, so. Excellent. All right, so that is a wrap on the DockerCon 2020 Open Source Power Panel. I think we covered a ton of ground. Um, I'd like to thank Chris, Kelsey, and Michelle uh, for sharing their perspectives on this continuing wave of Docker and cloud native innovation. Uh, I'd like to thank the DockerCon attendees for tuning in. 
Um, and I hope every, everybody enjoys the rest of the conference.